Chapter 5, Consciousness and Emotions. In this part, we will explain how and why living beings possess consciousness and emotions. This subject is a complex one and for many of us is psychologically unacceptable. The challenge lies, first, in the fact that there is no generally accepted understanding of what the consciousness is and what it means to be emotional. Secondly, we do believe that our emotions, caused by a love for living things and inanimate objects, feelings generated by art, music, poetry, humor, etc., all these manifestations of consciousness are related to the phenomena of a higher spiritual order. It is impossible to convince an ordinary person that a computer that is superior to us with solving quantitative tasks and plays chess better than world champions is capable for emotions or self-awareness in the same way as we do. Nevertheless, all emotions in the consciousness based on them can, in principle, be reduced into elementary signals. If you look at a highly pixelated picture, like of Mona Lisa's portrait, you will hardly find it beautiful. If pixels are still too large to recreate the gentle features of cloth and a silk merchant's wife from Florence, the beauty of her portrait cannot be revealed by a greater amount of the components, that is, by the number of pixels. No image is perceived by us as absolutely smooth because our eyes see the surrounding world in exactly the same way, in pixels. We can discern it with about 6 to 7 million photoreceptors. That is worse than a medium-grade digital camera. Each photoreceptor takes the photon energy and converts it into a nervous excitation, i.e. the flow of electrical signals. Visual perception, which we take 80% of information with, can be decomposed into small components. And what are the causes of our emotions? Can we reduce them to the elementary bits and analyze likewise? Why not? Do you like the smell of flowers, or the taste of a rare wine, or delicious food? Nothing mysterious. This is the action of chemical pheromones. These simplest chemical compounds form the information that enters your body in such a way that you take certain actions, immerse yourself in either melancholy or indescribable joy. They also may be reduced to the electrical signals. Moreover, our behavior can be controlled not only by our brain, but by such insignificant creatures as bacteria, viruses, and transferred genes. In the Sage Journal article, Humans as Superorganisms, How Microbes, Viruses Shape Our Behavior, Peter Kramer and Paul Bresson from the University of Padua, Italy, concluded that microbes in our brain can change and even control our behavior. Intimate emotions like recklessness, depression, excitability, mental illness, including schizophrenia. These alien elements' incentives do not necessarily coincide with the selfish interests of our body. Is not this a wonderful example of the way global mind can control everybody, keeping us under the illusion of a free will? In this book, the author tries to convince the listener that all living things are very complex, skillfully organized, but still, the combinations of elementary components linked together by an elaborately constructed information network. I am sure that this genuine attempt will meet a strong aversion. We all are under the illusion that pixelated and smooth perception of reality represents two different physical processes. Meanwhile, everything in the world consists of pixels called quanta. In physics, a quantum is the minimum amount of any physical entity involved in an interaction. It is impossible to imagine the magnitude of the amount of energy equal to 10.5 quanta. It should be equal to either 10 or 11. Our whole life and all phenomenon in nature are pixelated. There is nothing that changes continuously. Everything, including our emotions, varies spasmodically. Therefore, we can decompose our emotions into tiny but calculable components and analyze them. Once upon a time, the author of this book tried to develop nothing but a scientific theory of humor, a complex and inexplicable phenomenon that eludes logical analysis for centuries, found a simple, logical, and confirmed by many facts resolution. I even managed to reduce an emotion of the laughter to a mathematical formula. This formula works! The effect of humor can be mathematically calculated and predicted based on the subjective emotion components. There are people who accepted my theory, but the opinion of the majority was almost unambiguous. It is inadmissible to intrude into a subtle, inexplicable area of intelligence with crude logic and mathematics. And what can we say about such inexplicable subjects as music, painting, ballet, 
a delicate taste, and the aroma of a cigar, the touch of a loved one. No, 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 they say. Leave all attempts to attribute all these ephemeral experiences and subtleties of spiritual impulses to interactions of some elementary, pardon me, cells. Thank God, not everyone adheres to this categorical opinion. Arguing about music, the Saxon philosopher and mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz said, Music is a hidden arithmetic exercise of the soul, which does not know that it is counting. But if the soul calculates and receives pleasure from this calculation, and that happens in the case of humor, can we analyze these calculations and pixelate them? In this book, we will outline only the ways of emotions deduction. While trying to do this, we are not at all depriving the emotions of their charms. Since we have not been able to find a scientific definition of the concepts consciousness and emotion, we should reset the shackles of the pseudoscientific approach and assume that we already understand what they mean. Any reasonable person can easily distinguish between the conscious and the unconscious, living being from mechanical gadget and emotions from their imitation. Let us start with humor. Those who want to understand this matter deeper can find my book titled Humor Theory, The Formula of Laughter on Amazon. If we manage to explain the essence of humor, the task of consciousness and emotions would become much simpler. The fact is that computers cannot joke or even recognize funny things with a certainty yet. Despite that, there are already computers computers capable of writing good verses and composing pleasant music. You do not agree? Then here is a test which I found online. Try to tell whether the below verses are written by a human being or by a bot. Poem 1. Mortal my mate, bearing my rock a heart. Warm beat with cold beat company. Shall I, earlier, or you fail at our force, and lie, the ruins of, rifled, once a world of art? The telling time our task is, time is some part, not all, but we were framed to fail and die. One spell, and well that one, there, ah, thereby, is comfort's carol of all, or woe's worst smart. Poem 2. The dirty, rusty, wooden dresser drawer. A couple million people wearing drawers. Or looking through a lonely oven door. Flowers covered under marble floors. And lying sleeping on an open bed. And I remember having started tripping. Or any angel hanging overhead without another cup of coffee dripping. Surrounded by a pretty little sergeant. Another morning at an early crawl. And from the other side of my apartment, an empty room beyond the inner wall. A thousand pictures on the kitchen floor, talked about a hundred years or more. Are you positive who is the author of the above poems in both cases? Congratulations, you have an absolute literature taste. Therefore, I do not need to tell you the correct answer. The world's first computer to play music publicly was CSIRAC, which was designed and built by Trevor Piercy and Mastin Beard in the 1950s. Two further major 1950s developments were the origins of digital sound synthesis by computer and of algorithmic composition programs beyond note playback. Max Matthews at Bell Laboratories developed the influential Music One program and its descendants, further popularizing computer music through a 1963 article in Science. Among other pioneers, Lajarn Hiller and Leonard Isaacson worked on a series of algorithmic composition experiments from 1956 to 1959, manifested in the 1957 premiere of the Iliac Suite for String Quartet. British amateur musicologist Peter Russell referred to the computer-generated music as artistic and delightful after hearing it before being told of its origin. But if you can argue about the value of computer poems and melodies, then debates about computer humor are still pointless. This is the touchstone on which all the programs created for the Turing test are cut off. Remember that the test, proposed by Alan Turing, is intended to determine whether your interlocutor is a person or a computer. And here, significant progress has been made. It was reported in 2014 that chatbot Eugene Gustman, pretending to be a 13-year-old from Odessa, supposedly passed the legendary Turing test, tricking 33% of a panel of judges into believing he was a real boy during a five-minute chat conversation. In 2016, a team from MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, CSAIL, have created a deep learning algorithm which passes the Turing test for sound. Let me assure you that this book is narrated by a living person. Here is a roughly five-minute conversation with Gooseman. Judge, how are you adjusting to all your newfound fame? Eugene, I would rather not talk about it if you don't mind. By the way, what's your occupation? I mean, could you tell me about your work? 
Judge, I'm a technology blogger. Eugene, it's quite surprising that you are a technology blogger. Where did you come from, by the way? Could you tell me about the place where you live? Judge, I live in Boston, but I grew up in Minnesota. I also lived in Seattle for a while. Eugene, could you invite me to Seattle? I would be so grateful. Judge, I don't live there anymore, and it would be weird for me to house a 13-year-old boy no matter where I lived. Eugene, possibly it will be a big surprise for you. But no isn't the only answer. The word yes also exists. Want to ask me something more? Judge, that last answer of yours was a little shaky, bro bro. Eugene, damn, I've just recalled that I didn't feed my guinea pig this morning. Poor animal. Judge, ah, okay, we're changing the subject. What's your guinea pig's name? Eugene, name of my guinea pig's name is Bill, but I suspect he doesn't go by it. Perhaps he is deaf, and I should call him Beethoven. Judge, too soon, too soon for a Beethoven joke. Eugene, all the things you told me are nothing but a joke. I think you are trying to make a fool of me. Judge, well played. You appear to be able to detect sarcasm. Eugene, yeah, well, let's go on, though. Judge, okay, what's your favorite sport? Eugene, I play sports sometimes, on computer, but I prefer racing. Judge, do kids still say computer like that? Like, let's play computer? Eugene, I have nice Celeron 667, by the way. I play games on it. Judge, there's no way you have a Celeron 667. It's 2014. Eugene, I have Celeron so far. I'm not sure whether my next processor will be from Intel or AMD. Judge, do you have an iPhone? Eugene, if I say that I haven't an iPhone, Will it satisfy your inquisitive mind? And I forgot to ask you where you're from. Judge, you asked me where I was from already. Eugene, so what that you were from already? By the way, what's your occupation? I mean, could you tell me about your work? Judge, this is now unraveling at a rapid clip. Eugene, you're not the first one who told me that. Judge, nice save, you're back in the game. Eugene, possibly you are right. You aren't the first one who tell me that. Oh, anything else? Judge, I think we're done here. Congrats on the thing. Eugene, your opinion is very interesting. Keep going. And I forgot to ask you where you are from. Not sure about you, dear listener, but the young boy from Odessa seems to me a more interesting and lively interlocutor than his American examiner. An object that is inaccessible to a computer, the laughter, according to my theory, is quite a mundane and explainable phenomenon. There is no doubt that smart programmers will soon find the way to train a computer for jokes and anecdotes generation. This, in fact, is easier than composing a music or writing poems. One of the reasons why poetry has a strong emotional effect on us is also a satisfaction with instant, almost unconscious calculation. What is the difference between the verse line and prose? In the traditional, classical form, two things, a foot and a rhyme. Listening to the verse lines, our brain unconsciously perceives the rhythm in a number of syllables, comparing lines of the same size in different places of the stanza to each other. The mind assesses the quality and unusualness of rhyme. If the rhymes of adjacent or interval-separated lines and the number of syllables in them coincide, we mark this as a proper order and get satisfaction. If we catch a failure in the rhyme or a foot, for example, an extra syllable, this may indicate a low-quality poem or a special idea of the author, which we are also pleased to figure out and appreciate. German psychologist Wilhelm Wundt concludes that the immediate cause of aesthetic pleasure, from the perception of rhyme, is the ease with which the subject of our perception is brought to the ready-made forms of time and space in our mind. Here is the simplest example. There was a little guinea pig, who being little, was not big. He always walked upon his feet, and never fasted when he eat. For adults who are familiar with many samples of poetic creativity, this verse will not bring any pleasure. It is too easy for their trained brain to consider the widespread iambic tetrameter and catch the accord in elementary one-syllable rhymes. Pig, big, feet, eat. And here is an example of more sophisticated poetry. L. Cohen. They sentenced me to twenty years of boredom for trying to change the system from within. I'm coming now. I'm coming to reward them. First we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. I'm guided by a signal in the heavens. I'm guided by this birthmark on my skin. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. First we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. Remember me? I used to live for music. Remember me? I brought your groceries in. Well, it's Father's Day and everybody's wounded. First we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. 
Here, rhymes are more sophisticated. Heaven, weapon, music, wounded. The reader has to adjust certain words' pronunciation to fit the line into the right foot. This mental exercise serves as an intellectual reward for reading these simple, in general sense, lines. It adds and multiplies the deep meaning of the song, which is oblique lyrics are suggestive of religious and end-time themes, with reference to prayer, meaningful birthmarks, and signs in the sky. As you can see, mathematics can shed light on the charm of poetry as a phenomenon. And what about music? Well, I do not have a full explanation of our attraction to this art form yet but there is no doubt that it also has a simple nature. After all, sophisticated gourmets are not the only ones who love music. Children, animals, and even plants also fall under its charm. However, I will express one guess concerning musical chords. We know that some combinations of simultaneously sounding notes seem to us pleasant, others repulsive. A chord is any harmonic set of pitches consisting of three or more notes that are heard as if sounding simultaneously. Jean-Philippe Remieux, one of the most important French composers and music theorists of the 18th century, defined a chord as any combination of pitches separated by a third. Any other combination is a random one. Consider, the listener, that simultaneous reproduction of two notes does not represent a chord. Why is that? My theory is that perceiving the chord, we subconsciously compare the music intervals between them. A single interval between two notes is simply nothing to compare to. But a triad or a tetrad, pentad, and other chords create several intervals between nearby notes. If the lowest note is separated from the middle one by one third, and the highest one from the middle is the same third, this is a chord. If the intervals are not equal, or at least mathematically logical, our mind recognizes this as inaccuracy of the tone separation. When, on the contrary, we realize that the notes are arranged in a certain mathematical order, then the instantaneous mental work brings the listener a pleasure. Moreover, whole octaves can be added to the thirds, which only complicates subconscious computational work and increases intellectual pleasure. With an increased number of sounds to six or seven, the task of analyzing them becomes difficult, and therefore heptads, seven notes, and enneads, eight notes, rarely used. There are also dissonant chords, as there are dissonant rhymes and vers libre, free verse, intended for sophisticated ears. Fans of such music catch the deliberate unevenness of the distances between notes, and their mind tells the master, oh, well done, I recognize the computer's trick, bravo. The rhymes can be simple or sophisticated, they can end the line or be anywhere in the middle of it, can be dissonant and assonant. The chords likewise can be constructed according to more complex rules than the simple intervals of a third. But the distance between sounds always obeys some computable logic. Music is not only a calculation of the distances between notes. Canadian researchers Adil Malik, with colleagues in the article Anadonia to Music and Mu Opioids, published on February 2017, concluded that endogenous opioids are critical to experiencing both positive and negative emotions in music, and that music uses the same reward pathways as food, drugs, and sexual pleasure. They found that neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, activate receptors when listening to music. 